It is no secret that the history of the Russian Empire is entwined with that of the steppe. Groups like the Khazars, the Pechenegs, and of course, the Mongols, all played a role in developing the Rus principalities into the Russian state. Later down the line, the peoples of Siberia became further entangled as Tsars and Tsarinas conquered lands like the Khanate of Astrakhan and the Crimean Khanate. Such histories, clearly, were instrumental in Russian history. Hi, I'm Edwin, and I run the Nomads and Empires podcast. In my show, I cover the history of the Eurasian steppes from the perspective of those living on the steppes. We'll talk about peoples like the Scythians, the Xiongnu, and so forth, shining a light on their lives, beliefs, and history. We actually just started our series on the Scythians, a group intimately connected to Russian and Ukrainian history, so please, if you think this is interesting, then come join me on the Windy Plains of the Nomad and Empires podcast, available on virtually every podcast streaming service. And now, back to the Russian Empire History Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow, and this is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire, Episode 29, Olga of Kiev. I'm sure many of you have heard of Olga of Kiev. She's one of those female historical figures who has become a bit of an online cult figure. So this will be an interesting show as we go through her story in the tale of bygone years, discuss where it comes from, and what, if any, parts of it are true. We have already encountered her briefly, if you recall. In 903, the tale says, quote, Igor grew up. He followed after Oleg and obeyed his instructions. A wife was brought to him from Pskov. End quote. Olga is not mentioned again even a single time until 945 and the death of Igor. Immediately following the murder of Igor by the Derevlians, the tale continues, quote, But Olga was in Kiev with her son, the boy Sviatoslav. His tutor was Asmund, and the troop commander was Svinal, the father of Mysticha. The Derevlians then said, See, we have killed the Prince of Rus. Let us take his wife Olga for our Prince Mal. End quote. This is only the first attempt described in which someone is going to take, as they say, Olga. But let's just think about this for a minute. Olga was married in 903, and now it is 945. In 903, she had to be at least of childbearing age, unlikely under 16, probably a little bit older. So according to the tale, she's 50-ish here, but apparently people still want to marry her, and she has a young son. That just doesn't add up, because no one in the Middle Ages is marrying without the chance of an heir. But if we follow the reconstructed timeline we were looking at with Igor in the last episode, once again the problem is resolved. If we do that, Olga and Igor would have married a few years before Igor became king, and he was only king for three or four years. Maybe a period of ten years altogether, giving us a still entirely marriageable Olga in her mid to late twenties. Anyway. Let's crack on with the tale, because it's an action-packed adventure and we have a lot to get through. The Derevlians send their best men to Olga, and they arrive by boat. Olga graciously summons them and inquires as to why they have come. The Derevlians say that they have been sent to say that they killed her husband because he was a ravening wolf, but the princes who protected Dereva were good, and she should come and marry their prince Mal. Olga replies, quote, Your proposal is pleasing to me, indeed, 
My husband cannot rise again from the dead, but I desire to honour you tomorrow in the presence of my people. Return to your boat and remain there with an aspect of arrogance. I shall send for you on the morrow, and you shall say, We will not ride on horses nor go on foot. Carry us in our boat, and you shall be carried in your boat. End quote. If you're thinking that this weird stuff about being carried in boats has some kind of symbolic significance, you'd be right, and we'll get to that after we finish the story. Olga orders a deep ditch dug at the castle, and in the morning she summons the Derevlians. They demand to be carried in their boat, sitting in their robes and puffed up with pride. The people of Kiev carry them up to the castle and drop the boat into the ditch. Olga leans over and asks if the honour is to their taste, and they answer that it was worse than the death of Igor. Then she orders them buried alive. After that, Olga sends a message to the Derevlians, saying that if they really want to see her, they should send their distinguished men to provide an honourable escort to their prince. Otherwise, the people of Kiev will not let her go. The Derevlians get their best men together and send them to Kiev. Uh, when they arrive, Olga commands that the bathhouse be made ready and says they can attend to her once they have washed. The Derevlians go to the bathhouse to bathe. Olga's men bar the doors, set it on fire, and all the Derevlians burn to death. Olga then sends the Derevlians a message that she is coming to them to hold a funeral feast for Igor, and they should prepare. They gather honey and make a lot of mead. Olga arrives with a small retinue. They make a corgan for Igor. They start the funeral feast, with her followers waiting on the Derevlians. The Derevlians ask where all the men they sent her are. She says they're following with her husband's bodyguard. Once the Derevlians are drunk, Olga orders her men to attack, and they massacre the Derevlians. The following year, Olga takes Sviatoslav and a large army and attacks the Derevlians. When the Derevlians come out to give battle, Sviatoslav throws his spear at them, but it barely clears his horse because he's just a small boy. Spinald and Asmund cry, The prince has already begun the battle! and then they conquer the Derevlians. The Rus lay siege to Iskorosten, the city that slew Igor. After a year, they are still unable to take the city, and Olga sends a message to the people of the town. Why are you still holding out? The rest of your land is at peace. Would you rather die of hunger than submit to tribute? The Derevlians answer that they would be glad to submit to tribute, but she only wants to avenge her husband. Olga replies to say that she has already had her revenge twice on their messengers in Kiev and again at the funeral feast. She has no more desire for vengeance and only seeks tribute. The Derevlians ask what she wants, offering honey and furs. Olga says that they have neither, but she will take three pigeons and three sparrows from each house. I do not seek to impose a heavy tribute like my husband, she says. I require only this small gift from you, for you are impoverished by the siege. The happy Derevlians gather the birds and deliver them to Olga, who says that she will return to Kiev the following day. The town rejoices. That night, Olga gives each soldier in her army, pigeon or sparrow, and orders them to tie a piece of sulphur and a scrap of cloth to each one. They light these scraps and release the birds to return to their homes, setting the entire town on fire. The people flee into Olga's waiting soldiers. She captures the elders, gives some as slaves to her followers, and makes the rest pay a heavy tribute, which is split. Two-thirds to Kiev, and one-third to Olga's home holdings in Vishkorov. With this first part of her story complete, Olga spends some time setting Rus in order. She travels to Novgorod, establishes trading posts, collects tribute, sets up customs collection points. With this administrative work done, she returns to Kiev for a couple of years. In 948, the next chapter of her story begins. Olga travels to Constantinople to meet the emperor. The emperor, Constantine, 
finds her fair and wise and is amazed by her intellect. He remarks that she is worthy to reign with him in this city. Again, we're going to assume that Olga is not actually well into her fifties at this point, and the tale's timeline has an extra couple of decades inserted. Olga overhears the Emperor and says that she is still a pagan, but she would be willing to accept baptism if he would do it himself. With the help of the Patriarch, the Emperor does so. Olga is enlightened. The Patriarch instructs her and says, quote, Blessed art thou among the women of Rus, for thou hast loved the light and quit the darkness. The sons of Rus shall bless thee to the last generation of thy descendants. End quote. Olga absorbs the teachings of the church and is christened Helena, after the mother of Constantine the Great. The emperor summons the newly baptized Olga and tells her he wishes to marry her. But he is caught in a trap of his own making. Olga answers, How can you marry me after baptizing me and calling me your daughter? Church teachings did not permit marriages between godparents and godchildren. Olga, you have outwitted me, says the emperor. He gives her many gifts of gold, silver, silks, and various vases, and dismisses her. Olga wishes to return home and ask the patriarch for his blessing, saying that as the people in the sun are still heathen, she needs protection. The patriarch tells her that Christ will protect her, and she returns to Kiev. There's a digression here in which the tale compares her to the Queen of Sheba and extols her wisdom with a number of biblical quotes. The emperor sends an envoy to her, asking that she send him slaves, wax, furs, in exchange for the gifts that he gave her, as well as soldiers. Olga answers that if the emperor comes to visit her in Kiev for as long as she visited him, she would grant his request. Olga tries to convert Svetoslav, but he will have none of it. There are some pointed quotes from scripture about walking in darkness with hardened hearts and the deeds of the unrighteous. How shall I accept another faith, he says. My followers will laugh at that. If you are converted, all of your subjects will follow your example, says Olga. But Svetoslav did not heed his mother, says the tale, and then quotes the Bible again. Whosoever heedeth not his father or his mother shall suffer death. You think this is foreshadowing? Wait and see. Despite several more quotations in the same vein, the tale notes that Olga loved her son and continued to pray for him night and day, for him and for the people, until she brought him up to manhood and adult age. At this point, Without it being directly stated, it appears that Sviatoslav assumes the rule of Rus. While Olga remains in Kiev in a highly honoured position, and perhaps this is representative while he's on campaigns. I'm not going to cover any of Sviatoslav today because this is going to be a long episode already. So in brief, Olga is in Kiev with her grandchildren. Sviatoslav is elsewhere, and the Pechenegs invade Rus. Sviatoslav returns to save them, but declares that he does not wish to live in Kiev and plans to move his capital to the Danube. Olga begs him to stay, as long as she is alive, and then he can go wherever he wishes. Three days later, she died. Her son, grandsons, and all the people weep and bury her in her tomb according to the Christian rites, without a funeral feast. The tale concludes the story of Olga with two paragraphs which I will quote in full. Olga was the precursor of the Christian land, even as the dayspring precedes the sun and as the dawn precedes the day, for she shone like the moon by night and was radiant among the infidels like a pearl in the mire, since the people were soiled and not yet purified of their sin by holy baptism but she herself was cleansed by this sacred purification. She put off the sinful garments of the old Adam and was clad in the new Adam, which is Christ. Thus we say to her, Rejoice in the Rus knowledge of God, for we were the first fruits of their reconciliation with him. She was the first from Rus to enter the kingdom of God, and the sons of Rus thus praise her as their leader. 
for since her death she has interceded with God on their behalf. The souls of the righteous do not perish. As Solomon has said, the nations rejoice in the praise of the righteous, for his memory is eternal, since it is acknowledged by God and men. For all men glorify her as they behold her lying there in the body for many years. As the prophet has said, I will glorify them that glorify me. Of such persons, David also said, The righteous live for ever, and they have reward from God and grace from the Most High. Therefore they shall receive the kingdom of beauty and the crown of goodness from the hand of the Lord. With his right hand he will cover them, and with his arm he will protect them. For he protected the sainted Olga from the devil, our adversary and our foe. Well, that's some pretty serious editorializing going on there. Does it strike you as a bit strange, or maybe excessive, given the actual story that's just been told? Olga starts out as cunning and murderous, revenging herself on the eagle's killers. Not the most Christian of behavior. And after her conversion, she does not seem to actually achieve anything in particular. She succeeds in converting neither her son nor the people. So why the OTT glorification from the chronicler, who had basically no judgment to make either way on the previous three kings? And what about the story overall? With Oleg and Eager, the superficial impression was that it was a plausible history, and the problems with the timeline only appeared on closer viewing using other sources. Here I think that the symbolic or folktale elements jump out a lot more. The cunning tricks, the things that happen in threes, the enormous number of quotations from scripture that are clearly supposed to be telling you what you should think. Like a number of other figures, Olga has acquired a certain notoriety in recent decades as an example of a woman appearing in the histories at a time when mostly only men are mentioned. The whole over-the-top vengeance tale is often taken at face value in a kind of yay woman rule type key, even though it ought to be plain to even a slightly critical reader that it shouldn't be. So this time round, I'm going to flip the approach from last episode and talk about what the chronicler is doing with the folktale and symbolic elements. And then I'm going to go on to say why well, it doesn't matter if they aren't true, because the historical Olga was probably actually very impressive in her own right. The Chronicle starts the story of Olga with the memorable and action-packed story of her revenge on the Derevlians, which is usually the thing that she's most famous for. Besides the presence of elements found in many stories, especially the bird-carried fire attacks, members will have heard in the Varangians episode that Harold Hadrada did the same thing in Sicily, not to mention Chinggis Khan, Alexander the Great, Vikings in England, and a whole bunch of other cases. But there are also some things that alert listeners will have realized must have been some kind of symbolism that they might be missing. Like, what's up with being carried around in boats? Scholars have tried to explain the revenge story in several ways. For some, it's a remnant of pagan Rus folk traditions, and parallels are seen in the Nibelungenlied, the Edda, the Norse sagas and German tales. Others have placed it in the tradition of women posing riddles for their suitors, whether to test their worthiness or to fob them off if they are unwanted. The most likely origin for the story is a link to pagan Rus burial rituals. I'm sure you're all aware of Viking boat burials, have seen scenes of warriors floating off into the night on a burning funeral pyre, what we have in this story is a symbolic representation of Olga performing the burial and mourning rites for Igor and exacting vengeance on the Derevlians at the same time. And so the Derevlians are carried to her castle in their boat and cast into a pit, a grave, where Olga orders the people of Kiev to bury them. She doesn't have Igor's body, so she buries his killers instead. 
Then, Olga sends the Derevlians to wash in the bathhouse. In the funeral rites, the burial was followed by a ritual bathing. The final part of the funeral is the feast. Olga and her followers take the feast to her husband's murderers and then slaughter them all. So this story shows Olga honouring her husband by discharging her wifely responsibilities to properly bury and mourn him, as well as taking the appropriate pagan revenge for his slaying. Scholars take the campaign against the Derevlians and the burning of the city with the birds to be a later addition to the story. Olga did indeed undertake her mission to suppress the rebellious Derevlians, so the core of the story may be true, and the insertion of the completely implausible but widespread trope about using birds to burn the city is showing that she is cunning and clever, which is something we're going to see again in her dealings with Constantinople. The overall story is an excellent example of a common trope in Eastern Slavic folktales, a clever princess, which we'll probably cover at some point in a dedicated episode. This continues on Olga's trip to Byzantium, where she continually outwits the emperor's clumsy efforts to marry her, but it's hard to miss that we seem to be dealing with a different Olga. The woman accepting Christian training and baptism is not the vengeful warrior queen of a few years earlier. The general opinion among scholars has been that two traditions were combined here. The first is a folktale which gives us the clever princess with her trickery. The second is an ecclesiastical tale, part of a larger, now lost source describing the introduction of Christianity to Rus. This proposed source began with the baptism of Olga, then the Beringian martyrs, the conversion of Olga's grandson Vladimir and the mass baptism of Rus, the martyrdom of Boris and Gleb, the first Russian saints, and ends with Yaroslav the Wise. And much like the proposed tale of the Rus kings of the 10th century that we mentioned last episode, it has been split by the chronicler across the appropriate periods in the chronicle. This tale is the supposed source of one big theme that scholars have seen in the tale of bygone years covering this period, which is an attempt to create a parallel between Olga and her grandson Vladimir, who will lead the conversion of Rus, and Constantine the Great and his mother Helena. If you're not familiar with Helena, she is reputed to have performed a variety of pious acts, such as discovering the true cross on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and ordering the building of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem to house it, as well as a number of other churches, including the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. She is a saint in the Orthodox and Catholic churches, and as Constantine had his Helena, so Vladimir gets his Helena in the form of Olga. However, if you remember me mentioning the historian Sean Griffin last time, he has a different take on this. He argues that the search for now lost alleged tales of the conversion of Rus and comparisons to stories from other countries that don't really line up with the story of Olga are red herrings, theories that have appeared because of one particular gap in the knowledge of the scholars studying the tale of bygone years. As he says, Shakhmatov and his contemporaries, and still more Soviet historians, were at the least secular liberals, if not atheists hostile to Christianity. They could recognize a parallel to Constantine Helena, because that was in the realm of general knowledge, but they could not recognize where the tale draws directly on the Byzantine liturgy, because they did not go to church and had no personal experience of the services or their content. Western historians living outside of the Orthodox world were obviously at a similar disadvantage. But Griffin argues quite convincingly that the chronicler has built the story of Olga on the basis of parts of the Byzantine liturgy, framing it in a way that would have been accessible and understandable to contemporaries, but which modern audiences miss. So let's have a look at Olga in the light of the liturgy, which gives us much more than just 
Helena or Helena and Mary as models for Olga. One thing I learned as someone also from outside the Orthodox world is that in the Byzantine liturgy, the story of Christmas, of Jesus' incarnation, does not begin with the trip to Bethlehem or with the angels appearing to the shepherds to announce the birth or to Mary to tell her that she will bear a child, which is where I might have started it, or even with John the Baptist. Rather, it begins with the conception of Mary. Perhaps this is the same for Catholics. I wouldn't know that either. This is known as the Feast of the Conception of the Theotokos by St. Anna and was celebrated in Byzantium and Rus on 9th of December. According to the Byzantine liturgy, the conception of Mary by her parents, Joachim and Anna, is also the result of divine intervention when Anna is past childbearing age and therefore the fulfillment of prophecy. The birth of Mary is then celebrated on 8th September in a service that refers to other women in the Bible who also miraculously conceived late in life after the time for natural reproduction had passed, including the mother of John the Baptist, who was known as John the Forerunner in the Orthodox Church. His conception was celebrated in the Feast of St. John the Forerunner on 23rd September and his nativity on 24th of June. This led on into the Feast of the Annunciation, marking the incarnation of Jesus in Mary's womb on 25th of March and, of course, the Feast of the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, or Christmas itself, which in Byzantium and Rus was preceded like Easter by a full 40 days of fasting. The service refers to women among the ancestors of Mary, including others who had had miraculous births. Quote, the Virgin Mother of God, prophesied from the ages in the proclamations of the prophets, has appeared on earth. The wise patriarchs and the assembly of the righteous proclaim her, and with them rejoices the adornment of women. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Anna, together with the glorious Miriam, the sister of Moses. The ends of the world rejoice with them, and all creation gives glory. For God, the creator of all, comes to be born, to grant the world great mercy. End quote. As Griffin writes, quote, In him after him, at feasts spread across several months, medieval Christians were taught that the creator of all could not simply appear on earth out of thin air. A special and holy path had to be prepared for him, and this sacred task was accomplished by a single bloodline. A little further on he continues, What all of these hymns emphasize is that the salvation of the world was not simply the story of a single, of a single saviour, even if that figure were God himself. Redemption came with an extensive intergenerational background story. It had a concrete and well-established narrative shape. Righteous forebears paved the way for zealous forerunners and holy mothers who preceded the emergence of a very special kind of man, a chosen king who guided his people to everlasting salvation. End quote. I think you can see where we're going with this, right? The story of Olga, particularly the part about her visit to Constantinople and baptism, and the extended panegyric upon her death, are an attempt to overlay this narrative framework onto the history of Rus. More than merely a mirror of Helena and Constantine, Olga becomes the righteous forebear of Vladimir, the chosen king. So let's take a closer look at that baptism story. I don't want to overburden this episode with too much esoteric detail, so I will just note that although we do not have surviving copies of the earliest liturgies used in Rus, work by scholars to compare later liturgies with Byzantine texts show that the Slavonic versions of the services would have been very close to those used in Constantinople. 
You may have the idea that conversion was a fairly simple matter, perhaps only requiring a public acquiescence and baptism. You may be thinking of Charlemagne baptizing the Saxons, or Vladimir herding the Rus into the Dnieper. But that kind of thing was the exception rather than the rule. The actual conversion process required study and took quite some time, especially for a VIP convert like Olga. Several rites had to be performed over a period of around two months. The first was to mark the budding convert becoming a catechumen, that is, a student of the faith. The convert would lie before the doors of the church, and the priest guiding them would ask God to open their mind to understanding. Then there would follow forty days of fasting with morning, midday, and evening prayers. With the fast complete, another service would mark the start of the second phase, in which the catechumen attended church every day for prayers for exorcism, intended to protect them from the devil, who was working to prevent them reaching baptism. Each prayer was repeated ten times, commanding the devil to leave the convert and depart to the infernal abyss. On the evening before the baptism, the priest would ask the catechumen to turn to the west and declare, I renounce Satan and all of his works, and all of his services, and all of his angels, and all of his shame. This was repeated fifteen times, followed by symbolically spitting on the devil and reciting the creed. The priest would then pray for the salvation and blessing of the catechumen. On the day of the baptism, the service began with blessing the water using a prayer that was already 500 years old by the time Olga heard it. The priest dipped his finger in the water and made the sign of the cross, once again banishing all evil and asking for God to manifest his transformative power in the water. The priest then anointed the convert's head, hands and shoulders with blessed oil, and then they entered the font where they would be submerged three times, with the priest declaring, using their Christian name, quote, The servant of God, Helena, is baptized in the name of the Father, Amen, and of the Son, Amen, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The baptism was followed by the chanting of Psalm 31, concluding, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. The congregation then sang the baptismal hymn, and following this came the chrismation. The priest anointed the newly baptized person's forehead, eyes, nose, lips, ears, breast, hands, and sternum, saying each time, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then a cross would be hung around their neck. To complete the ceremony, the priest would cut a few strands of hair from the convert, which were mixed with wax and added to the walls of the church. Blessings and a long life were prayed for, and then they walked in procession three times around the font. The final step was the delivery of instructions on good Christian conduct. According to Griffin, rather than being a mishmash of lost ecclesiastical tales and hagiographies, the what he calls Blessed Olga of the Tale of Bygone Years is created almost entirely from the two kinds of services I've just described. The series of feasts covering the preparation for and birth of Christ, and the services for the initiation of adult pagans to the church. Griffin illustrates this very clearly in a way that I can't easily convey to you in audio form, taking passages from the descriptions of Olga's meetings with the emperor and the patriarch, he bolds the sections of text that are lifted verbatim from the liturgy, which looks like half to a third of the text depending on the paragraph. The fact that the text specifies the patriarch rather than a bishop or some other kind of priest is also significant. This shows that Olga's baptism can be tied to a specific place and liturgy, the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. The patriarch personally performed baptisms there on several feast days, 
Theophany, which marks the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came to the apostles, Lazarus Sunday, commemorating Jesus raising a man from the dead, and Holy Saturday, the day after Good Friday, when, according to Orthodox tradition, Jesus' body lay in the tomb, but his spirit harrowed hell and liberated those held captive. As well as tying Olga's baptism to Constantinople, it is noticeable that while the emperor is a personalized individual in the text, the patriarch is not. He has no name and appears only to perform his liturgical functions. Following her baptism, the tale says that when Olga was enlightened, she rejoiced in soul and body. In the Byzantine liturgy, baptism is called enlightenment, and the phrase soul and body is a common idiom through their services. The patriarch's address echoes the liturgy. Blessed are you among Rus women is based on the ancient Ave Maria hymn, which was used to close the daily evening service and would have been very familiar to anyone hearing it. And why was Mary blessed? Because she was chosen to bear the Saviour. And why was Olga blessed? Because the Saviour of Rus would be her descendant. He declares that Olga will be blessed by the sons of Rus to the last generation, as the Magnificat spoken by Mary in the Gospel of Luke declares, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, and again for the same reason. The patriarch then gives Olga instructions on living a Christian life, which are drawn straight from the liturgy. This is an interesting little detail, because you would naturally expect the instructions to come before the baptism which is indeed how it is performed in the Orthodox Church today. But here it comes after. Some scholars put this down to error, but Griffin speculates that it suggests the original writers were not Greek priests at St. Sophia, as, as Shakmatov argued, because if they were, they would have known the correct order. Some scholars put this down to error. But Griffin speculates that it suggests the original writers were not Greek priests at St. Sophia, as Shakmatov argues, because if they were, they would have known the correct order. Olga listens piously with her head bowed and accepts the patriarch's blessing, as well as asking him for his blessing again later. This is not just random blessing seeking, it reflects the roles played in the baptism ceremony. The patriarch declares that God will protect Olga as he did Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and an assortment of other biblical figures. This again echoes the liturgies, which frequently request the protection granted in the past and praise God for defending believers. And so Olga is given the Christian name of Helena, after another righteous woman who was treated as a Mary figure, who was a convert, and who was the forerunner of a leader who would convert the people. The Byzantine liturgy included hymns of praise for Helena. For example, How wondrous is your love and your divine image, O glorious Helena, the boast of women! For upon coming to the places where the Saviour and Master of all accepted the most pure passion, you adorned them with marvellous churches, singing out, Bless the Lord, O children, or Truly blessed is the belly, and sanctified is the womb that carried you, O peace-loving emperor, the joy of Christians, O divinely appointed Constantine, and so on. As Helena became the Byzantine Mary, so Olga in the tale of bygone years becomes the Slavic Mary, the progenitor of Vladimir, who will bring Christianity to Rus. So rather than being a folktale, like the story of the revenge on the Derevlians, which has had bits and pieces of references to biblical figures and Christian holy women inserted in it, the story of Olga's visit to Constantinople and her baptism by the emperor and the patriarch is very intentionally constructed to create a symbolic Olga that fulfills an important role in the overarching narrative of the Christianization of Rus 
which I think we can all agree would have been one of the key interests of the monks writing the chronicles. This narrative extensively uses elements of the baptismal liturgy and everyday hymns that would have been familiar and evocative to the people of Rus, and effectively conveyed the intended message to them. The chroniclers cap this narrative with their final paragraphs on the death and burial of Olga and the closing panegyric I quoted in full in the introduction, where Olga is explicitly declared to be the precursor to dawn, the moon, a pearl in the mire, righteous, glorified, and sainted. Using textual highlighting again, Griffin shows that, that almost the entirety of this text is lifted from three liturgical sources. The Menaeon, which contains the hymns and prayers used each day and the various feasts taking place at various times. The Eucologion, which contains the services for things such as baptisms, the Eucharist and other sacraments. And the Prophetologion, or collection of readings from the Old Testament. The chroniclers identify Olga with John the Baptist, who is also referred to in the liturgy as the Dayspring, or Morning Star. It compares it to the moon. The Orthodox feast of the conception of St. John the Baptist compares his mother, Elizabeth, to the moon. So this is again setting up the Olga-Vladimir relationship as part of a succession of great parent-children pairings, and once again highlights her role as the Slavic Mary in the conception of the Saviour of Rus. The next section, describing Olga's spiritual purity, paraphrases 1 Corinthians 15, before again quoting a hymn praising Mary. Then Olga is again presented as the forerunner, the first Rus to enter heaven and prepare the way for her people to follow. This passage fulfills the patriarch's prophecy over her that she will be blessed by Rus' sons until the last generation. In the Orthodox tradition, the saints in heaven intercede for their people on earth, and so Olga continues to stand for the Rus before God. The panegyric concludes with several Old Testament quotations to reinforce, to reinforce the themes, bringing together John the Baptist, or John the Forerunner, as he is in Orthodox Christianity, Slavic Mary Helena, and the triumph of Orthodoxy in Rus. As Griffin notes, none of these quotations or paraphrasings of the liturgy were random choices or simply biblical citations. They worked together coherently to place Olga within a framework that was fully comprehensible to medieval Rus. Quote, By praising the princess with the words of these lections, the scribes were making a clear statement about her place in the history of Rus. In their eyes, Olga was a saint, and she therefore deserved to be praised using the same readings the same markers of liturgical prestige, which were used for her predecessors on their feast days. So, if the vengeful Olga dealing with the Durevlians is a folktale, the clever princess is a common trope, and the Olga who visited Constantinople and got baptised is an elaborately constructed role slossing her into the mythology around the Christianization of Rus. Does that mean that Olga of Kiev, the popular proto-feminist, all-action smart heroine, outwitting the men around her, was nothing but an invention? I don't think so. Let's take a look at what we can figure out about the historical role. I think you'll agree that she must have been a pretty impressive person in her own right. It's worth noting, once again, that the chronicles were written by monks who wrote under the influence of their monastic worldview and may have chosen to ignore women, even if women were a part of public life in Rus. There was one monk at Mount Athos, one of the most significant eastern monasteries, who was abandoned on the doorstep of the monastery when his mother died four hours after he was born. No one came to claim him, so he became a monk and he lived all 82 years of his life there, which meant that he never saw a woman, or even a female animal, both being banned from the mountain. 
except maybe birds, I guess. This kind of monastic culture could easily create a worldview in which women had no place other than the action we have just heard Anna, Mary, Helena, and Olga being so effusively praised for, childbirth. In the story of Olga, we can see that the monk saw no reason to mention her between her marriage and the death of Igor, even though this is nearly four decades in their timeline. Not even for the birth of Igor's heir, which might be considered the kind of thing the Chronicles should record. Once Vyatoslav is grown up, the Chronicle quickly moves on to his deeds, and Olga basically disappears from the story again. But besides overlooking her like this, there are other things missing from the Chronicle that maybe paint a different picture. It is missing any dispute concerning the succession to Igor, even though Sviatoslav is only a small child. This could partly indicate the entrenchment of the Rurikids as legitimate rulers, that the nobles of Rus were willing to accept and wait for the heir to the line to take the throne, rather than making a grab for it themselves. But it's also missing any challenge to Olga as regent. There is no Oleg, the commander of the army, assuming a position as some kind of regent or mentor. Olga's authority is, to all appearances, immediately accepted. Although the first part of the revenge story is most likely just a folktale, she is depicted as taking command, and everyone follows her orders. In the attack on Iskoristan, which could derive from whatever action she actually did take to suppress the rebellious Derevlians, she leads the campaign and her role is not questioned. So despite only being mentioned in a single sentence as the Bride of Igor, we have to assume that she had already established herself in Kiev and earned the respect of the Rus notables. It's highly unlikely that she was just sitting around sewing and having children or doing any other activities we might take as the stereotypical woman's place in the medieval world. To step into the position of the ruler without opposition, she would have had to have been used to administration and giving orders, and others in position of authority would have to have been used to taking those orders. The tale of bygone years tells us that Olga carried out administrative reforms in Rus and travelled to Byzantium for trade negotiations and baptism. The visit to Byzantium is recorded in Byzantine and Western sources, although, as we shall see in a minute, there are ongoing arguments about what happened and the significance of the visit. The reforms in Rus are also supported by the historical evidence. These were important reforms that both resulted from and facilitated changes that were occurring in Rus as it developed. Rus was by now already well established under the Dnieper. The trade on the Constantinople route is developing rapidly, and at the same time the Khazars are in decline. Relations are strained, and the eastern trade is shifting to Volga Bulgaria. More Slavic peoples are coming under Rus rule, the population is growing and the structure of the state is developing in response. So let's update our image of Rus and take a look at how things stand in the time of Olga. Rus had reached a time of transition, and Olga introduced reforms in response to the changes that were taking place. These changes can be seen in several areas, and we can see how Olga's actions even though they are skimmed over fairly quickly in the tale of bygone years, aim to develop Rus further. So we have a transition away from being only a trade intermediary to the local production of goods in Rus for export, as well as the beginnings of an expansion in agriculture. We have a move to increased centralization and the formation of a kingdom centered on Kiev, and we have a transition from being a foreign ruling elite to being part of the people that they ruled. The wider conditions around Rus are also changing. When the Scandinavians first moved into the east, the Slavs living in the forest steppe belt on the edge of the western steppe, and gradually moving into the steppe, were under the rule of the Khazars. 
And there were also steppe peoples settling in the periphery of the steppe as their neighbours and turning to agriculture. This was the saltive culture that we discussed in episode 18 on the economy of Hazaria. The Pechenegs breaking through the Khazar bulwark against the migrating peoples from the steppe put an end to this. Although there was no coordinated campaign of conquest, as I've noted, the Pechenegs never managed to unite as a single force, there is extensive evidence of smaller scale raiding. Across the region, settlements and fortresses were burned down and abandoned during this period. This included a chain of fortresses that the Khazars had built to project their power into the western steppe. For now, the biggest fortress, Sarkel, remained in their hands, but it seems like other key strategic strongholds were lost. The result was effectively the end of the salt of culture. At the same time, Slav settlers were pushed back into the forest where they had some shelter against the steppe raiders. Instead of pushing south, they would be moving in increasing numbers east towards the Volga and north towards Gurudishin. This process was a symptom of Khazar decline, which would soon culminate in their downfall. For 300 years, they had blocked further westward migrations, but although they might claim overlordship, they were not able to stop or fully control the Pechenegs. But the peoples who had been chafing under the rule of the Khazars might find themselves regretting the loss of the Pax Khazarica. So this was the situation in which Olga found herself. The first reforms dealt with internal organization. Igor had been killed because he was out personally collecting tribute from his subject peoples. But this, which had been the custom since the Scandinavians first arrived, was the action of a warlord, not a king. Kings established a system for their income, and that is what Olga did. Following the reconquest of the Derevlians, which would have been the first essential step, she established laws and tributes. The tale notes that the trading posts and hunting reserves she created are still there. She returns to Kiev for a year, and then she sets out on a longer-range expedition to do the same thing. She travels to Novgorod, establishing trading posts, boundaries, customs and hunting reserves throughout the whole region, which the tale, writing from 300 years later, once again notes are still in place. So what Olga has done is establish a system of royal administration to control the main trade routes and hunting grounds throughout Rus, at least the areas under her control, Kiev, Novgorod, Pskov. At this point, we do not know, for instance, whether Kiev had any control over Chernihiv, which was around the same size as Kiev, had a strong Scandinavian presence, was also focused on their trade with Byzantium. But whatever the case, in Rus, customs and tribute will now be collected for the ruler by local administrators. The archaeological record from this period shows that Rus was booming, and not only in Kiev. Although the chronicler comments at the arrival of the Derevlians that, quote, at that time the inhabitants did not live in the valley, but upon the heights, end quote, this is probably another chronicler anachronism. Finds show building on the Podil, the floodplain at the foot of the Kiev hills, growing rapidly around this time. These include Scandinavian-style large log houses rather than the semi-subterranean houses of the Slavs, as well as artisan workshops and a number of chamber-like graves. These chamber graves were built for the warrior elite of the Rus. They are a local development. Similar graves are found in Scandinavia only in and around Birka, that is, at the Baltic end of the Eastern Road. Quite a large number of the graves do not contain a body and are believed to memorialize warriors who died on expeditions, serving in the Varangian Guard or otherwise away from home. The graves combined a funeral pyre and a barrow. The deceased, often accompanied by a horse and sometimes by a woman, was burned and then the site was covered with an earth mound. The grave goods 
weights and balances, full sets of weapons, horses and slave girls, were not found in Rus' graves before the 10th century. A sword was placed at the deceased's belt, their spear beside them, and a shield leant against the wall of the chamber. Around 40% of these graves contain only women, presumably representatives of the same elite class. The majority lie on that north-south axis we've been talking about the last couple of episodes, following the Rus route south, Stare Ladoga, Gorodice, Pskov, Nilsdova, and most of all on the middle Dnieper. Only individual sites have been found in the eastern Rus areas towards the Volga. The grave goods are not Scandinavian. Many items do not have direct Scandinavian equivalents, so riding gear and ornamentation on weapons is often similar to Turkic or Magyar items. And we also have evidence that Magyar artisans were resident in Kiev and producing exactly these kinds of hybrid weapons with step ornamentation, both for local customers and for export further west. Only about 20% of the graves found in Shistovica and on Starokivska Hill can be linked to Scandinavians. The others almost certainly included Slavs and people of steppe origin. So we have what looks like a specifically Rus elite emerging, one not only Scandinavian in origin and with its own cultural practices that combine elements from Scandinavia with Slav and steppe components. Olga's son, Sviatoslav, who is the first ruler with a Slavic name, is going to be an excellent example of this. He will also be an excellent example of something historians Simon Franklin and Jonathan Shepard highlight in their book, The Emergence of Rus, that the early Dnieper period of Rus that we see in the archaeological evidence and contemporary writings is a harsh frontier land, a man's world characterized by near-constant warfare. In the northern towns, items associated with women, brooches, jewellery and so on, are found more commonly than weapons. In Gnilsdova, half the graves are women with rich grave goods. The closer to the steppe we get, the fewer graves of women and the more male grave goods. The graves in Kiev are predominantly warriors, and all the graves in Chernihiv are warriors. But presumably the gains made the risk worthwhile. This is the period when most of the hordes of dirhams we have found were deposited, and the economic boom is traceable across Rus territory. Timurova reaches its maximum size in the mid-10th century. Stara Ladoga expands rapidly between 930 and 960, not only occupying more land, but also building bigger halls and laying them out according to a street plan. There are new workshops and numerous finds of trade goods and items such as scales and weights. Sometime in the 940s, the people of Gorodice laid out wooden streets a couple of kilometers further down the Volkov and began building a new township, carefully laying it out according to a street plan. This site has extensive evidence of shipbuilding and repairs, finds of rudders, planking and rivets. Just think of how punishing the river voyages with just think about how punishing the river voyages would be with portages and rapids and dragging the boats across sandbanks, and you'll see why their gateway to the east was the ideal place for a concentration of shipyards. The site is also rich in luxury goods, glass, cornelium, dirhams, and other trade goods. And if you've remembered that Novgorod means new town, you will have already guessed how Gorodishin acquired its more famous name. Gnazdova more than tripled in size in the mid-10th century, and for the first time fortifications were built around the town. Stara Ladoga, Novgorod, and Gnazdova show a stronger Scandinavian presence. Their expansion may be due as much to increased numbers of Scandinavians visiting the trade as to Slavs moving northwards. Franklin and Shepard speculate that they remained within the range of seasonal trade voyages, 
well, the middle Dnieper Penal was the point of no return, where permanent or at least long-term settlement became the norm. None of these Rus cities were self-sufficient. The Rus were making their first forays into farming around Lake Bielorosera, but they essentially acquired their produce through tribute or purchase. It was worth them expanding into the edges of the steppe, despite the dangers, because this meant they could carry their trade goods to the customer themselves, rather than going through middlemen, as they did in their trade with the Islamic world. Indeed, it may have been the greater danger in the south that drove the formation of the Rus as a separate people. There is no evidence that the Scandinavians in Gorodysia or Stara Ladoga needed to band together to defend themselves against the Balts and Finno-Ugrians. The forest populations were smaller and well dispersed. The Scandinavian visitors were able to operate as independent merchant adventurers. On the Volga, the evidence suggests that there were more Rus than on the Dnieper, and they were richer. But they were also widely dispersed, and likewise had no reason to concentrate together for safety and to create a larger organization. They were operating in lands controlled by the Bulgars, and the Bulgars set the rules and provided protection. So it was the conditions on the Dnieper that drove the true emergence of Rus. Greater danger from the steppe required more military organization, which required more leadership, which required resources for organization, which required administration. And so under Olga we see the appearance of a Rus state with customs levies, a portioning of the land, centrally controlled trading posts, consistent rather than ad hoc collection of tribute the creation of an administrative framework that would still be in place centuries later when Lavrenti sat down to write his tale. With her domestic tasks well in hand, the obvious next move for Olga was international relations. We know for sure that Olga did go to Constantinople, her visit is mentioned in several Byzantine and Western European sources, and historians have been comparing them to the Rus chronicles and failing to find a consensus on what actually happened since Schlotzer. The official Byzantine record of the visit says that Olga brought 43 Rus merchants to her first official reception at the Great Palace, and 44 to the second which is about double the number of merchants listed as attending the negotiations in the 944 treaty. The Byzantine chronicles imply that the trade talks were the main purpose of the visit, which would be consistent with the Rus-Byzantine relationship up to that point, and is further evidence for what we've just been discussing about the booming Rus economy and Olga's efforts to reform and expand trade. Once she had established trading posts and clear routes within Rus, along with custom stations to impose levies, she would naturally have wanted to increase the international trade flows and therefore her revenue. Olga also has a Christian priest named Gregory in her retinue, so she may have already converted or be considering conversion as a way to strengthen ties with Byzantium. Conversion to Christianity was a major point of value in negotiations around trade and alliances at the time, but it could also mean that the independence of the converting nation was on the table. For the Slavic countries, they had a choice of alignment between the Byzantines and the Germans. The rivalry between the Latin Church and the Orthodox Church that would eventually grow into the Great Schism was already well underway, although not to the extent that Rus engaging with either one would mean rejecting the other outright at this point. The members' episode on Cyril and Methodius and the birth of Slavic literacy has a more detailed look at this. Returning to Olga, some scholars have argued that Gregory was a priest sent by the Byzantines to influence her, But the Byzantine records suggest that he was shut out of the receptions and official ceremonies in Constantinople, 
which means that he probably came from elsewhere, most likely the Germans. His presence with her entourage would have been a message to the Byzantines that Rus had options when it was looking at conversion and alliances. The question of whether Olga herself was actually baptised in Constantinople also lacks a clear answer. The Byzantine sources only call her Helga, which is of course the Norse version of her name, but they never use her Christian name Helena. This goes against the Byzantine convention of recording pagans baptised in Constantinople, who are always referred to by their Christian name. This looks even stranger given that she was supposedly baptised by the emperor himself with the patriarch's assistance. On the other hand, Western writers do call her Helena, and the German chronicler Adalberta of Magdeburg says that she was baptised in Constantinople. Once Olga is back in Kiev, she receives a message from the emperor asking for wax, slaves, furs, the traditional goods that Byzantium acquired from the Rus, and soldiers, indicate, as well as soldiers, indicating an alliance between Kiev and Constantinople. Olga is not receptive, though. She sends a message telling the emperor that it's his turn to come and visit her in Kiev, and then she'll see. This is most likely showing that the negotiations Olga conducted in Constantinople were not successful, and she did not secure whatever agreement she was looking for. Unlike the cases of Igor and Oleg, the text of the bygone years does not include a copy of any agreement that she made with Byzantium. The failure to reach an agreement with Byzantium is also supported by a look at the Western sources. Following the exchange of messages with the emperor, Olga sends an envoy to Otto I, the German emperor, asking him to send priests to Rus. Otto arranges for Adalbert of Trier to be made Bishop of Rus, and he arrives in Rus in 959 with a troop of priests. Three years later, he returns to Germany, admitting defeat in his mission and blaming it on the strength of pagan opposition. Probably this is due to Sviatoslav assuming power, as we've already seen, he had no time for Christianity. Why was Olga interested in closer alignment with Byzantium or Western Europe? Byzantium and Ottonian Germany were the dominant powers of the time. A rising Rus kingdom would have had interests beyond just trade, culture for example. Missionaries from Byzantium had already created an alphabet for Slavic languages and were translating historical and natural science texts along with liturgies and scripture. The buildings and art of the classical world would have inspired emulation in any of the Rus who were visiting. The importance of the church would also have been obvious to Rus travellers in either Constantinople or the West. The conversion of a nation offered benefits to both the converts and the people who facilitated the conversion, and there was real competition between Christian rulers to fulfil that role. There was also the question of marriages and alliances. There was no question of a marriage between a pagan prince and a Christian princess, unless the prince was ready to convert. While Byzantium was willing to enter into agreements on trade or military assistance, where it thought it was in its interests, a marriage between the imperial family and a pagan Rus ruler was out of the question. However, it would not be Olga who resolved these questions. Remember, her sainthood is for being the forerunner and progenitor of the saviour of Rus, the Slavic Mary not for success in converting Rus herself. So, while the derevelian, slaughtering, bird-burning, clever princess Olga of the Tao may be a folktale with who knows what, if any, basis in fact, and the holy Olga, the Saint Helena of Rus, may be constructed entirely by monks with little reference to reality, the real Olga seems to have been a fairly impressive woman. She stepped into the power vacuum after Igor's death without opposition and with apparent competence. She carried out economic and administrative reforms that endured for generations, 
and she laid the groundwork for expanding Rus' international relations with powers beyond the Scandinavian trade routes. It's a shame that the celibate monks writing the Chronicle had so little use for women that they leave us only able to guess what kind of person she actually was. The next Rus' ruler up is one of my favourites, if only because he was so different to the others, Olga's son, Sviatoslav. But before we get to him, we need to take a trip to the east, where another kingdom has emerged in parallel to Rus, one that will be its rival for the next 600 years. Join me next episode for a look at Volga Bulgaria. Thank you for listening and especially to all patrons and subscribers for your support. Until next time, goodbye.